Mr. President. Mr. Speaker, Senator Kelly, Representative Candelora, First Lady Andy Lamont, <laughs> Lieutenant Governor Bicewitz, <laughs> members of the General Assembly. Since I last joined you here in the People's Chamber, we've lost the champion for Connecticut, Representative Quentin Hugh Williams. Hugh fought for a more equal and just Connecticut. Let us all dedicate ourselves to that work. My primary focus for the next two years and beyond will be economic growth and inclusive opportunity. That is what my proposed budget will deliver. For the first time in over a generation, Connecticut has enjoyed strong economic and population growth. And more taxpayers, a growing economy, coupled with our shared fiscal discipline, has resulted in four balanced budgets, soon to be five. So building off of this momentum, my budget continues to grow the economy through a middle-class tax cut and investments in our young families, education, workforce training, workforce housing, and helping families eliminate medical debt. And we will continue to move from rescue to recovery, from lifelines to ladders to opportunity. And none of this would be possible without your collective hard work over these last four years which is the foundation for our next chapter of growth and opportunity for all. All right, now let's get into specifics. A little wonky. One of the smartest actions the General Assembly has taken over the last decade has been the enactment of the fiscal guardrails that have provided predictability and stability to our budget process. You did that, thank you. These fiscal controls have ended the era of wishful budgeting and the so-called permanent fiscal crisis. And together, we have made historic payments towards our unfunded pension liabilities, honoring our commitments to our teachers and state employees, and saving the taxpayers billions of dollars into the future. And tomorrow, you will have an opportunity to extend the bond covenants and related fiscal controls for another 10 years, and I hope you do. Every dollar we eliminate from fixed costs are dollars we can use to provide tax relief and additional services to the residents of our state. And these guardrails have contributed to a full rainy day fund, which provides us protection in the case of unforeseen risk, and we've seen a few of those, whether they be geopolitical disruption, a recession, a pandemic, or a federal government shutdown, Connecticut is well positioned to weather that storm. <laughs> Look, we can't predict the future, we have a responsibility to be ready for it. So this budget builds on the momentum of the last four years, and COVID be damned, we're just getting started. As a result of our sound fiscal management today, I'm proposing for the first time in, say, 30 years, we cut the personal income tax for working families and the middle class.
Look, we currently tax families for 3% of their first $20,000 in income and 5% of their income up to $100,000. And my proposal will cut the current 5% rate by 10% and the 3% rate by one third. I want a sustainable tax cut that we can support in good times and not so good times. Look, we've had a number of false starts and promises and on again, off again tax cuts, not this time. For those families most in need, I also want to go a step further. I'm proposing a 31% increase in the earned income tax credit. What do you say, Marty? 31%. Look, increasing this tax credit is one of the most impactful things we can do to target direct relief to those more than 200,000 low-income workers who are struggling to provide for their families. And 97% of the EITC funding goes to families with children. I'll say thank you. Just as an aside, I can tell you that for the first time in recorded history, this is the one issue where Ann Hughes and Dick Nixon agree, the earned income tax credit. <laughs> the ITC, EITC is one of the best anti-poverty tools we can use because it encourages work, it boosts working families, and it uplifts generations to come. And it's about time that we increase it and increase it for good. <laughs> so thanks to these two reforms, families earning less than $50,000 a year will pay no state income tax. Families earning less than $60,000 per year will receive a 20% tax cut. And those earning less than $150,000 a year will receive a 6.5% tax cut worth about $500. These combined savings for taxpayers, these two proposals, that's worth nearly $500 million a year in tax cuts. All right, so while keeping more of what you earn helps, some people still can't afford to get back to work. That's why affordable daycare is a precondition to young families being able to get back to work and giving their kids the very best head start in life. Our commitment to daycare in this fiscal year kept more of our centers open, provided up to, one, up to $70 million in wage support payments for child care workers, $25 million to subsidize 1,300 additional slots for infant and toddlers, and we're just getting started. Our proposed budget increases child care rates in the state's largest child care program, Care for Kids. It increases it by 10% each year, each year of our biennium. And today I'm announcing that Commissioner Beth Bai will be convening a blue ribbon panel, including employers, providers, families, legislators, to focus on designing the next generation of childcare with incentives for the business community to provide more on-site support and to ensure childcare system works for all of our stakeholders. Our budget incentivizes employers to help their employees with childcare. I'm proposing to provide employers with a 25% corporate tax credit, 25% of the cost of any childcare cost subsidies they provide for their employees.
On education, our budget increases ECS by $135 million, in addition to the $720 million in federal resources still to be invested in education over the next two years. <laughs> Recruiting and retaining the best teachers in the world builds on our strengths as one of the first states to get our schools open and always ranked as one of the best schools in the country, right here in Connecticut. So as we allocate federal resources, Commissioner Charlene Russell Tucker wants our superintendents to prioritize teacher recruitment, including recruitment from our historically black colleges and the University of Puerto Rico. hear a lot about education reform. I would say the most important education reform is a great teacher in the classroom. We have the greatest teachers in the classroom. We got to keep it up. <laughs> and our budget allocates an additional $10 million for flexible grants that will help districts address staffing shortages. This is funding that districts can spend on programs like supporting apprentice teachers and accelerating the pipeline to the next generation of teachers. Earn while you learn and earn while you teach. And too many of our kids are still absent from school. So our budget includes an additional $7 million for the LEAP program, where counselors are knocking on doors trying to get our kids back to the classroom, back to the classroom. <laughs> and tomorrow, you're going to have a chance to vote to provide students another important reason to get back to school universal free lunch for the rest of this academic year. That lunch means better performing students and one less expense for our middle class families to worry about while inflation is still high. All right. So the good news is that Connecticut still has a strong economy with almost 100,000 jobs unfilled. And our budget rewards employers who provide on-the-job training and expands the Office of Workforce Strategy to provide training to fill those jobs. A high-paying job in less than six months of training. That's a pay raise for you and a stronger economy for all of us. And we're going to continue to develop the short-term certificate program, training programs, working with our employers, large and small, as well as the trades, to train the next generation of workers. Some of the major industries we'll focus on is, of course, manufacturing, healthcare, information technology, transportation, green jobs, life sciences, all good-paying jobs just waiting for you. And we're going to continue to speed up certification for our teachers and nurses and other in-demand professions, allowing them to get to work faster with less debt. All right, so this budget will continue the 50% tax credit for Connecticut employers to help in-state graduates retire their student loan debt. That's one more reason for our graduates to stay in Connecticut and one more reason for our employers to hire right here in Connecticut. And millions of dollars of workforce training will go to naught if we don't have enough housing where workers can afford to live. So for the first time in a very long time, more and more young families are moving to Connecticut. 
Last year, we built more market rate and affordable housing than any time this century. And you know what? We're still desperately short of housing. Look, having just climbed out of a fiscal crisis, I don't want to fall into a housing crisis. So in addition to increasing our investments in affordable housing, our budget proposes an additional $200 million for workforce housing, which will allow the state to provide more housing options for you and more financing options for our developers so they can start building more quickly. We project increasing the number of new housing units built in Connecticut by 6,400 units over the course of this biennium. And look, time is money, and this housing trust fund will allow developers to move quickly with an emphasis upon multi-unit housing in downtown areas close to transportation. But I'm also going to urge mayors and first selectmen to develop and act upon a plan of their own where they will allow more housing in their community through friendlier zoning and expedited approvals. Towns may submit their plans to facilitate housing on their terms, but doing nothing is not an acceptable strategy. So more workforce housing in our downtown areas, that will energize our cities, most of which, by the way, are much smaller than they were, say, uh, 50 years ago. They have room to grow. Also, the income and wealth disparity in our country has gotten much worse over the last generation. Increasing the minimum wage, debt-free community colleges, no-cost workforce training, that allows you to get a higher paying job in less time. They all help address income disparities. But the key to building wealth for yourself and your kids is ownership owning your own home, and even owning your own business. So not only does our budget provide more housing options, we've also increased our commitment to the Time to Own program to $50 million each year, $100 million over the biennium. What does that mean? Time to Own assists low and moderate income families with a down payment and closing costs on their first home. Let's say you have your eye on a $300,000 home, which requires a 10% down payment. Your new job will allow you to save, say, $15,000 over time. May say pay for half of that down payment. Call Time to Own. And we'll provide you a forgivable loan for that other $15,000. All right, you just bought your first home. Gives you a stake in the community and ownership. Your new job may provide you the insights and experience you need to start your own business. Our budget builds on $275 million in funding for small businesses across our state, with a special focus on those in low income and historically underserved communities. And through the $150 million boost fund, more than 100 investments have been made to date primarily for women and minority-owned businesses. To build long-term wealth and stability, ownership of your home, ownership of your own business, they can build the building blocks for success for every zip code in our state. Said it before, I'll say it again. Not more taxes, but more taxpayers, homeowners, business owners. This will allow you to build wealth a stake in your community, and a growing grand list that reduces property taxes for everybody. Housing will complement our major transportation hubs with over $800 million in additional federal support to strengthen and speed up our aging transportation system. Garrett Euglito, our Commissioner of Transportation, and our infrastructure czar, Mark Bouton, are working with the Transportation Committee, mayors, councils of government to lay out the future transportation system for our state that's financially and environmentally sustainable, accessible for everyone who needs it, and safe. We have clear goals over the next 10 years. 
we will reduce travel time from New Haven to New York City by over 20 minutes. We will run Metro North State uh, trains to Grand Central and now Penn Station. You will. You will see new and improved cars on the Hartford line. Metro North will have 5G service, and that train can double as your high-speed office. Look, our investments in rail are already reaping dividends. There are nearly 50% increase in rail service between Waterbury and Bridgeport has fueled over 500 new units of housing and counting. We haven't forgotten about our roads. Our major roads and highways were designed 70 years ago for much less traffic. And our Department of Transportation has targeted the worst bottlenecks. And they have a plan to make improvements. Extended on-off ramps. That will reduce crashes and limit congestion. And also more advanced traffic signals will speed up your commute to work and your ride home. You already noticed all the smart stoplights are in and around the Department of Transportation. Let's build that out so we all have more convenience. Look, if you want to keep our fiscal house in order, we need to remember that there's no such thing as a free bridge. And new federal resources continue to require that Connecticut provide 20%, 50% on the competitive grants as a local match. So we must be thoughtful about keeping our transportation fund solvent to take advantage of this next opportunity. Look, we've already begun reconstruction of the Gold Star Bridge between New London and Groton. We were one of four states in the country to receive that incredibly competitive bid worth $158 million. And we're not gonna stop there, right, Anthony? We're not gonna stop there. Connecticut is also making a $55 million down payment on state electric vehicles and charging stations, which will speed our move to an all-electric, carbon-free transportation future. <laughs> Look, as we move away from fossil fuels, we gotta make sure that we have the necessary electric generating capacity making us less dependent on faraway supply chains and giving us more control over our own future. So we have doubled down on Connecticut's own Millstone nuclear power plant, always on carbon free with a below market fixed price contract, extending through the end of this decade and hopefully beyond. Our big investment in wind power should turn on over the next few years, adding capacity at another fixed price. And Commissioner Katie Dykes has led our New England states in pushing for electric transmission lines between Quebec Hydro and our New England grid. Hydro will be another very cost-effective leg of our energy stool, with Connecticut well-positioned to have reliable electric generating capacity for the foreseeable future. So tomorrow I'm going down to Washington, D.C. I'll be meeting with um, my fellow New England governors, talking about regional energy strategy and security. And working together, we're going to improve reliability and drive down costs. And here in Connecticut, we will maintain our energy efficiency fund, investing $200 million annually, which allows families living in older homes to greatly reduce their electric and heating use, saving money and reducing carbon emissions. I was struck reading that while our electric prices here in Connecticut are too high, our cost per home is about the same as it is in Texas. How does that be? They have much lower energy prices. But they also have less efficient homes that drink more electricity per square foot. It's a reminder, efficiency works. And beyond energy and housing, we've got to do more to make our state more affordable. Deirdre Gifford is leading our health care cabinet as we try and tame the high cost of health care, which impacts families and businesses and our state budget alike. 
Our Office of Healthcare Strategy is taking the lead as we set up our benchmarking price evaluator. What is that? Where you can access the best healthcare by quality at the best value, reducing costs to you. And we're using cash incentives to lead state employees to designated medical centers of excellence. And we will be rolling out a discount card which make sure that consumers can access the best price for their prescriptions when they go to the pharmacy. And we've added $34 million to reflect additional enrollment for covered Connecticut, our zero-cost Medicaid-like coverage initiative. Not enough. Record high numbers of Americans have put off care due to high co-pays and deductibles. So my proposed budget includes a plan to use $20 million in federal funding to cancel an estimated $2 billion in medical debts for tens of thousands of our Connecticut residents. Connecticut res residents who are struggling to pay down their debt. You know, you, you get out of the hospital feeling a little better, and you get that hospital bill, and you get sick all over again. So this initiative will not only help Connecticut residents who are saddled with debt, but it will also lift the significant emotional toll that this type of debt has on individuals who do not have the means to get out from under that crushing debt especially for those who are still experiencing significant medical problems. Medical debt is the leading cause of bankruptcy in our country, leading cause of bankruptcy in our state, and it hangs like a dark cloud as you try and get your health and your bank account back in shape. Look, the ultimate solution to this problem is affordable access to quality health care for everybody, for everybody, for everybody. We must drive down the unsustainably high cost of medical care so consumers never again have to accumulate so much debt to keep themselves out of the hospital. I'm calling on all parties, including insurers, employers, hospitals, pharma companies, step up and be part of the solution. <laughs> you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. All right, so as we have for four years in a row, I propose to you a budget for fiscal 24, fiscal 25, which is in balance. It honors the fiscal guardrails you established in 2017. It makes the biggest investment in childcare, in education, in workforce, in transportation in our state's history. All right. So some of you are saying, okay, Gov, uh, that's a good start, but you haven't gone far enough. So for those of you who want maybe a little bit more spending here, or those of you who want a bigger tax cut there, that's fine. Tell me how you're going to pay for it. I can tell you that um, this next fiscal year, our budget's pretty tight. There's no surplus built into it. Fiscal 25, if the economy holds up, we do have a little more flexibility there, so let's talk. But I can tell you that this is a budget that's built to expand growth and opportunity for all of our residents. It's anchored by a middle-class tax cut, keeping faith and expanding assistance for those most in need. This is my budget, and within it, our values. Each and every one's aim squarely at economic growth and inclusive opportunity. I saw a lot of you at the basketball game last night at the XL. UConn men did pretty well. <laughs> it's 
So UConn is coming back. Connecticut's coming back. God bless Team Connecticut. Thanks, everybody.